Okay. Okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to this course, BC 214, on uh, developing the human spirit. Thank you for joining the class. Let's just take a moment to pray and then we will get started. May I request somebody to pray with all of us? You can unmute your mic and just pray with us, please. Let me pray. Go ahead. Father, we bless you for the nice Monday you have lavished to us. We praise you because there is none like you, and uh, you give us an opportunity to study and to learn from you. Lord, we pray that you open our mind mm -hmm. so that we can receive the revelation that you have brought in our life this morning. We pray for our pastor. May your grace help him to deliver what you want to, for us to receive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Good morning, everyone, once again. Um, just want to bring your attention to the fact that I have um, posted um, uh, an updated PDF. Uh, last week, there was a lot of good questions and a lot of good discussion uh, during the class. So I, um, I really appreciate that. Uh, so after the class, uh, I went back and I just updated the notes just to uh, make sure that things are clear and bring clarity. I felt uh, I made some mistakes when I was responding to the question. So uh, I thought, um, you know, we would update the PDF uh, and make things clear for all of us. So please uh, take the um, updated PDF of um, the lecture notes. Uh, we will go through it today. And then of course we will go forward um, in uh, all that we have been talking. All right, so good. I appreciate all the questions and all the discussions we had um, last week. I'm going to go ahead and share this um, updated PDF. Uh, we will review some of the things that we spoke about and then move uh, move forward um, in in what we uh, what we are learning. So we are trying to understand. Um, so this course on developing the human spirit really uh, is uh, just bringing our attention to the spiritual aspect of our lives, and we want to uh, learn how to develop the spiritual part of our lives. So uh, we um, are, first of all, talking about understanding the human spirit. So uh, we will delve a little deep into this aspect of um, what the scriptures teach us on the human spirit. And then we want to learn about the faculties of the human spirit and also the functions of the human spirit and then how to develop what are some of the things everything is going to be from the bible uh, we're not going to you know uh, go out of the scriptures we're going to stay within the scriptures in talking about developing the human spirit what are the things god has given to us so quickly to review and uh, from the interesting discussions we had um, last week we looked at these scriptures which show us that we are tripart being spirit soul body and uh, we mentioned that, uh, you know, the word spirit and the word heart are used synonymously in the New Testament, uh, just to break down the definitions. Uh, the, the word spirit, and, and I think I didn't forgot to mention this, but the Greek word is pneuma. Uh, and uh, what I do want to bring our attention to is that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is only one word uh, that's commonly used for spirit. So pneuma is in the Greek in the, and ruach is in the old. Um, and uh, uh, you know whether it is referring to the human spirit or the Holy Spirit or sometimes to an evil spirit is depending on the context. And, uh, and so um, the way the, the, the scriptures will tell us what what, we are, what is being referenced is um, a small s is used for human spirit 
or sometimes an evil spirit. And a capital S is used for the Holy Spirit or Spirit of God. And that's based on the context. So that's how, um, just something to keep in mind as we are reading scripture. Uh, the word soul uh, is the word suke with the seat of mind, will, and emotions. And um, uh, I have uh, added in this document uh, a later section on uh, notes on the human soul, a side note. So just to see how this word suke is used in the New Testament. And I've taken this from the uh, Wines Dictionary. So just studying that word. And uh, it's very, and, and, as, and if you look at the usage of that word, it's uh, sometimes used to refer to the natural life of the body, but very often you will find it's used to refer to the seat of emotions, uh, will and purpose and appetites and so on. And, and that's how we can, you know, come to, you know, this statement that uh, the word soul is referring to specifically, I mean, if you want to put it in a very concise way, it's the seat of mind, will, and emotions. So I give that end note there so uh, you could look into that. And then, of course, the body is the outer part of us with which we contact the physical world. It will die. It will go back to dust. It came from dust. It will go back to dust. So the spirit and soul are housed in the body. The body is like the tent or the dwelling place uh, in which the spirit and soul uh, reside. Uh, we also said from Hebrews 4 and verse 12 that the spirit and soul are distinct. When it, it, the, the, the word of God divides, uh, penetrates to dividing us under spirit and soul. Uh, but yet at the same time, there are so, uh, they are so interconnected. Sometimes it's not easy to distinguish, you know, that not easy to distinguish that. Uh, and, and also in scripture, and I've given, given these references, that there is that overlap scene. Sometimes body and soul are spoken of together and body and spirit are spoken of together. And emotions are expressed both by the soul and the spirit. So the spirit is the real person. And the spirit must be thought of as a person, not just as you know, uh, some sort of uh, air. Now, the, the word Greek, the Greek, the Greek and the Hebrew word simply means uh, wind or air. Ruach or pneuma simply means wind or air. But while, while that's the words, or those are the words that are used, whether in Hebrew or Greek, it does not mean the spirit is just air or some invisible material. But it's, it is a person, the real person, as we saw from First Peter 3, 4, the hidden person, it's a real person. So the spirit must always be understood as a real person. That's the real you, the real me. So the, the spirit is the real me and the spirit in, dwells in this physical body and has a soul closely connected, very hard to distinguish. Um, now, what I did say last class was the physical functions of the brain, uh, which are uh, the expression of the soul, meaning the mind, the thinking, that's in the physical. And, uh, you know, psychologists or neuroscientists would, or neurophysicians would treat the brain in order to affect certain soulish functions, meaning the emotions, um, the thinking, so on, through psychology and through neuroscience, medicine. But that's dealing with the physical side of the soul. They are the, it's a physical expression through the body. And to some extent, they do affect, you know, through administering chemicals. And we also know right, when we take in chemicals, whatever, they affect the emotions. You can feel high, you can feel excited, yeah, all those things, but they're affecting the physical expression of the soul. And that part of the soul, that means the brain will die, will, will cease to exist, will cease to be expressed when the physical dies. But there is the eternal side. So the inner man, the soul and the spirit are referred to as the inner man or inward man. And you find this in the New Testament scriptures. You know, Paul talks about uh, though outward man perish, Yet the 
inward man is renewed day by day. So the inward man is becoming stronger, although the body is getting old, is aging. And we are strengthened by his spirit in the inner man, Ephesians 3.16. So the inner man, again, is another term used, but it refers to the spirit and soul together. Some of the other things, and this is kind of where we stopped last uh, class, you know, there were a lot of questions on, okay, what happens when a person dies? Uh, we know that um, uh, the, the body without the spirit is dead, James chapter 2 and verse 26. So the spirit and soul, the spiritual soul, leave, spirit and soul leave the body. So the body dies, the functions, the seas here on earth. But the person, the real person, continues to live either in heaven or on earth in hell and uh, we said that there is consciousness and they're very aware and related to this were a lot of questions which uh, i tried my best to answer questions like uh, uh, are there emotions uh, for this spiritual person the answer is yes because we saw in scripture that emotions are connected both to the spirit and the soul so this spiritual person after death living in heaven or in hell has emotions. Um, is there, uh, the other question was, is there recognition? Can we recognize people? Again, we said yes. Now, uh, we see examples in scripture where the spiritual being recognizes, right? So they're able to recognize spiritual beings. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they were able to recognize uh, um, Moses and Elijah, but that, that knowledge was given, of course, by God. Because, you know, we've never seen David or King David or Paul the Apostle. But I'm sure when we go to heaven, we will, there will be this recognition. This is who this person is. So there is that, you know, recognition. We will also recognize the ones we know. So there is that aspect. Then there's other question was, uh, is there remembrance? Is there remembrance? Can we remember things on earth? And to that, uh, I gave an answer, which, you know, is, is a, I think, according to my personal understanding, um, uh, that, uh, you know, people who are in hell remember things from earth uh, more in, uh, as in connection to their torment. They remember all the missed opportunities and the rejection of the gospel and so on. But it's part of the torment. Whereas we know that in heaven, heaven is not a place of torment. Uh, God does not remember our sins, our iniquities. And so to that extent there will not be the remembrance of our failures and our wrongdoings uh, because God wipes all clean but in heaven uh, perhaps and I'm just saying perhaps because we're not very sure to some extent there will be remembrance of all the good works we've done for which we will be rewarded in heaven so to that extent uh, there may be the remembrance of good things that we've done then the last question that was asked last week was um, uh, can beings in the spiritual world see what's happening here on earth? So example, the human spirits that have gone into hell, can they see what's happening here? The human spirits gone into heaven, can they see what's happening here? Now, to speak in general terms, in general, the spiritual world can see into the natural world, meaning God obviously sees everything that's happening. Uh, there is some indication that angels see what's happening. The Bible says, you know, the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul that re repents. So obviously, they are very aware of uh, a, a person who repents. So, you know, in that sense, the spiritual world is looking in. Uh, we also last week referenced Hebrews 12 uh, when we said, you know, that the Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and two is giving us a picture of this great amphitheater or this great grandstand where, uh, you know, all the people are uh, uh, watching the ra runners running the race. So perhaps from that sense, there is some, they could be uh, looking at some of the things happening here. But obviously, human spirits who have gone into heaven are engaged in the worship of God. They're not sitting and, you know, watching everything here on earth. So uh, there is that limitation. So uh, the way I responded to that last week was, you know, to whatever degree God allows them to see, they will be able to see. But I don't think uh, they're sitting there always watching everything we're doing. Uh, they've got more interesting things to do in heaven. Um, 
So that was our response, and uh, we kind of paused there. All very interesting questions, and I was not really prepared for <laughs> all those questions, but it was very good. Now, they're going to go forward from there and cover, uh, try to move uh, forward, and trying to understand the human spirit. So we're going to pick up from here, uh, John chapter 4, and uh, uh, again, I'll keep time for some questions uh, towards the end of this class. So we are spiritual beings. The real person, you, is a spiritual person or a spirit person, right? Now, extending that thought, here are some things you must keep in mind. God is spirit. Right? So Jesus said this. Um, could somebody read that for us? John chapter 4, 21 to 24. I know it's a very familiar passage. Um, but might be good to read it now. John chapter 4, 21 to 24. Somebody could read it out loud for us, please. Shall I read past? Please go ahead. John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24 says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, you know, makes it very, very clear that God is spirit. That means he is not a natural being like us, you know, meaning talking about us, natural beings or the animals or plants. He is a spiritual being, a being living in a different realm, but he's a real being. God is not just an idea or a feeling or an emotion. He's a real being, but in a different realm. God is spirit. Now we are beings living in this natural realm. So uh, we engage with this natural realm, the body and all, um, you know, the natural world. But we have been created with the capacity to engage with God in a different realm. God is spirit. He's in the spiritual realm. We are living in this natural realm, but we are spiritual beings. We are also spirit. And therefore, we have the capacity to interact with God. And here Jesus says, you know, when you worship God, you worship in spirit. That means as a spiritual being, you are connecting with him. Now, of course, our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and our body is involved in the process of worship. So example, you may kneel, you may raise your hand, uh, you may cry, uh, you feel emotions, and that's all part of you and me, you know, that's part of us. And that is also involved in worship, but real worship, Jesus said, is a spiritual thing. It is you, the real person, the spiritual person, interacting with God, who is in the other realm, in the spiritual realm. And I was uh, trying to imagine how <laughs> this is not, chapter and verse is just imagination. You know, I just want to imagine, uh, you know, one way of illustrating this is you think about man or human person going to the moon, right? So he, this, this human person is in a totally different atmosphere, different. And he, he is living in, or he's actually inside a, uh, the astronaut is actually inside a space suit. So the space suit, again, this is not a very good example, but it, it's what enables him to, you know, be on the moon. But the real person is not the space suit. The real person is inside the space suit, the human person. 
the human person actually has the capacity to live here on earth right this is his real environment where he but he is in a space suit is able to operate in a different environment which is moon so if you want to think about it like this you know put it transfer that idea back to us you know the earth is like the moon for us i mean this is how this is a realm you know we the body and the soul enables us to operate here but the real person you is actually created to operate in the spiritual realm so if you want to put it like this our real home is the spiritual realm now we it's very hard for us to think in those terms because we are so comfortable in the natural realm and we are so unfamiliar with our real environment which is the spiritual realm but our real environment is the spiritual realm because you and i are actually spiritual beings and we are actually in a space so to sort of speak in the natural realm this is the body and the soul that enables us to engage with the natural realm but the real you is meant for operating in the spiritual realm and is designed to connect with god who is spirit okay think about it but we are not we are babies so to speak when it comes to the spiritual realm things because you know we are spending so much of our time engaging with the natural world but that is god is preparing us for that other realm and uh, and we will you know we're going to spend the rest of our time as spiritual beings living from the spirit into the natural in philippians 3:3 uh the apostle paul again reiterates that he says you know and i'll just reference it quickly philippians 3 and verse 3 he says we are the circumcision who worship god in the spirit so he saying look we worship god in the spirit and our worship of god is empowered by the holy spirit and it's a really a spiritual thing now uh, and he says we have no confidence in the flesh that means our interaction with god is not based on the things we do in the flesh but it's really a spiritual thing so extending that thought to christian ministry uh let's go to romans chapter 1 and uh, Can somebody read verse nine for us, please? Romans one verse nine. Can I read, Pastor? Please go ahead. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, <clears throat> that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Mm, thank you, Sumiti. notice what he says here what paul says here god is my witness that means you know god knows what i'm saying is true god is my witness he says whom i serve with my spirit or in my spirit so paul is the great apostle he has uh, written so many letters Uh, he has gone on so many missionary journeys uh, he he has suffered a lot physically he has been beaten he's been stoned everything physically in the natural but what he's saying here he says i serve i serve god in or with my spirit i want to emphasize that phrase here he's saying I serve God with my spirit. So really or you can in so the word serve you can say you can use the more sophisticated word I I minister. I do ministry. That's the same word. I serve. I do ministry. I do God's ministry or you know the work of the ministry how in my spirit or with my spirit. So really ministry is a spiritual work it should come out of our spirit uh now there's nothing wrong uh, of course 
in the outward man, of course, you know, you, we, we have to, you know, wear proper clothes and uh, we need uh, our mind um, to communicate. So, uh, you know, you, you speak whatever language you're speaking to your audience and you try to communicate well. All of that is fine. It's important. But really, ministry, we serve God with our spirit. So ministry is a work of the spirit. I'm talking about the human spirit. So the question is, what is the condition of the human spirit? We lay a lot of emphasis. I'm trying to contrast we put a lot of importance on the outside. Okay, if you're going to preach, you know, wear a nice suit, tie, uh, you know, all of that. Okay, uh, you know, speak nicely, uh, be eloquent, use, you know, nice words, uh, all of those things. Uh, you know, we put so much emphasis on the outside, outer part. It's okay. I mean, to some extent, it's okay. You don't overemphasize it. Of course, you have to, you know, be able to communicate with people. So to that extent, okay. But really, Paul is saying, I serve God with my spirit. So the question he asks is, what is the condition of the spirit? Because that is where the real work comes from. What is the condition of our spirit? If my condition of my spirit is weak or it's not where it's supposed to be. Uh, how will I be able to serve people? So that is one of the things we want to achieve in this course. Because all of us are, are going to serve God in some way. And we serve or we do ministry with or in or from our spirit. And uh, therefore, we must learn how to keep our spirit strong in good condition. And we must learn how to engage with God in the spirit. So because our primary interaction with God is in the spiritual realm, our human spirit interacting with God who is spirit. So that from God can really work through us. And that ministry will not just be the exercise of our intellect. Intellect is good. I'm not against it. We should have a good mind. Ministry will not just be an exercise of the outside. Now the outside must, you know, look good. You dress decently and properly and all of that. Fine. But really ministry should come out of our spirit. That's what we're going to go after as we progress in this course. I'm going to cover one more point and then uh, we will take up questions. So, of a human spirit, we need to understand how things progress in relation to our natural life on earth. So, at some point, our human spirit was created. Okay, now I'm sorry I didn't put the reference here. It just came to my mind. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Uh, you know, I probably will update the notes after teaching the class. Uh, but let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, I want us to look at two verses. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, we will look at verse 9. And we will look also in Hebrews, same chapter, Hebrews 12. And we will also look, where is this verse? Hmm. Uh, 23. So can somebody read Hebrews 12, 9, and also verse 23, please? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? 
next is uh, 23, right, Pastor? 23, 23, yes, please. Okay. To the, to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. So, look, let's look at verse 9 and verse 23, Hebrews 12. In verse 9, it, it's referring to God as the father of spirits. So, you talk about human spirits. God is the father of spirits. So he is the one who creates. He's the one who creates spirits. And he's a father of spirits. I mean, see, he's the one who has, who has created every human spirit. Now, of course, he created the other kinds of spirits, meaning the angels also. That is not the focus of our course. So for now, we just leave it aside. But talking about human spirits, he's the father of spirits. So he created. So at some point, in the birth or in the conception of the human person. So we're, we're looking in the natural. We're trying to draw a parallel right? in the natural and the spiritual. So in the womb of the mother, conception took place. We don't know exactly when, but God knows. At some point, God, who is a father of spirits, created the spirit, the human spirit of that person. And that human spirit came to dwell in that uh, baby being formed in the womb. In fact, without that spirit, there is no life to the baby, right? Because the body without the spirit is dead. So, if we want to put it in sequence, we would say God was a father of spirits, created that human spirit. And that human spirit came into that physical uh, thing, physical baby that started being formed in the womb. And it is growing. Now, Hebrews 12, 23, I want to point out something, but we will come back to it further. In Hebrews 12, 23, remember, the writer has already referred to God as the father of spirits. Now, in Hebrews 12, 23, the latter part, he talks about the spirits of just men made perfect. Two things the spirits of just men. That means these are people who have been made righteous. Remember the word just or righteous, interchangeable. They've been justified. These are the spirits that have been justified. They have been made justified. Just, spirits of just men, righteous people. Made perfect. Now, that word perfect, don't um, get confused. In, 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 we would use the simple English word mature, mean grown up. That means the spirit has been made righteous or just and is grown up. It has become mature. We will come back to it or we'll come to it. This is indicating to us that the spirit can grow. It is made perfect, made mature, made grown up. That's what it's saying. So going back to this, God created the human spirit. It came into the human body at some point. And then the baby was born. So the baby is born, but the real baby is a human spirit whom God created. 
the baby's body, like we're saying, is the outer man. And just as the body, the baby's body and mind or soul develops over time, the spirit also is made or is growing up. Is say in what sense? We will talk about it, right? The spirit is also growing up. So what we seem to understand is that there, there seems to be, and I say it seems to be because uh, we cannot prove it conclusively from scripture. There's only probably one passage in Romans chapter seven that kind of seems to indicate this. There seems to be a stage of innocence. Let me talk about spiritually. A stage of innocence. So let's read Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. Somebody could read that, please. Romans 7, 7 to 10. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, in, came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Romans chapter 7, and we will study Romans in detail next year, third year. But here in, in Romans 7, Paul is talking about his life under the law and his struggle, his struggle under the law. That's the essence of chapter seven, you know, how he struggled. He knew what was right. He wanted to do what was right, but he was powerless to do what was right because there was something else dominating him. Essence of Romans seven, a man under the law. But while he's describing his life and his struggle and he's saying, look, it is the law that made me aware of sin basically, because if the law wasn't there, I would not have known what was sin and what was not sin. I would not have known what was right and wrong without the law. But while he's describing all of that in Romans 7, it's very interesting in verse 9, he says, I was alive without the law. That means before I knew the law, I was alive. But when the commandment came, that is when I got to know the law, sin became big. Sin is like sin came alive and I died. So this verse is often understood in this way, that what Paul is referring to is, now we know that Paul, and just looking at his background, he was born as a Jew. So the only time he would have been without the law was before he started learning the law as a Jew. So now Jewish boys would start learning the law at an early age. But uh, let's say maybe eight or 10 or 12 or something like that. So the only time he would have been without the law, without knowledge of the law was in that early stage of life. Because from an early age, they will start learning the law. So what we can understand from verse nine is before he started learning the law, he was alive, he was alive to God. His spirit was very alive. But then when he started under getting understanding of right and wrong, what happened? Sin came alive and he died. 
Now, when he says he died, it's not talking about him physically, talking about him spiritually. So based on Romans 7, 9, and I'm saying, therefore, I'm saying, you know, we can't say this conclusively because it's just one verse in the scriptures. And it's not good to, you know, establish solid doctrine on one verse. Therefore, I'm saying this uh, with caution. And I say, I'm not saying this is conclusive, but many Bible scholars would agree on this, that there seems to be a stage of innocence. In, we're talking about the human spirit. So as the body or the natural person is growing, the human spirit is alive, open to God, very open to God. And many children would, you know, would share about their own experiences, how in the early stage of life, they were very sensitive to God, very alive. It says, I was alive. The spirit was very open to God in the early stage. At some point, so they call it, they refer to this as a stage of innocence in children. At some point, when the knowledge of the commandment, what is right, what is wrong before God. You know, early in the early stages, they say, okay, don't do this, don't do this. It's right and wrong before, you know, mom and dad or things like that. But at some point, there is this sense of understanding of right and wrong before God. At that point, he says, when the commandment came, and I, I, I got an understanding of commandment, what's right and wrong before God, then he says, I died. So there is a stage of innocence, and right after that, in every human person, unless they are born again by that time. Now just imagine, they're not born again, okay? So the child, uh, the, the person, um, at some age, we don't know, maybe we could say eight or 10 or 12, generally people say 12 years, we don't know, but there's that stage of innocence. Then they get an understanding of right and wrong. And if they're not born again by that time, the default is death. So that's why we understand, you know, Psalm 51 verse 5, the psalmist said, in sin, my mother conceived me. In Romans 5, 12, it says, you know, for talking about Adam's sin, by one man, sin came into this world and sin passed on all men, for all have sinned and death passed on all men, for all have sinned. So this death affects every human person right after the stage of innocence. So, by default, unless the person is born again, by default, we are without the life of God. The human spirit is living. I mean, I mean this is a real person. The real person is a human spirit, but without the life of God. So we, we are going to come back and look at these two scriptures, but I realize we only have seven more minutes left. So I want to pause and take questions. But so we are trying to trace the, the development of the human spirit. God creates a spirit. There's a stage of innocence. Right after that, there's death. Death means it's the absence of the life of God. The human spirit, is no longer alive to God. Death, death doesn't mean the human spirit ceases to exist. No, the person is still alive, but he's not alive towards God. He doesn't have the life of God from that moment on. But if they are born again, then they, they continue to grow towards God. Okay, let me pause here. I uh, will take some questions. We'll discuss. We have only about six minutes but let's try to do the best we can so let me go here all right let's go a lot of questions here hope hope says still i'm confused moses said that he wanted to see god but god told him you will just see my back so did moses see the spirit of god or what so hope so hope's question is what did Moses see? Did he see God's back? Did he see the Spirit of God? So Moses, uh, so hope, God, you know, revealed himself in the Old Testament. And even today, God can reveal himself in many different, 
tangible ways, ways that we can uh, 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 tangible ways and ways in which we can relate to God. So you see many expressions, right? Whether God reveals himself in a cloud or a pillar of fire or, you know, a burning bush or a hand that comes and writes on the wall or whatever. That does not mean God is a cloud or God is a fire or God is a burning bush or God is a hand. It's just that God is making him with himself visible in our earth realm in a way that a human person can see something of him. So when we put that in, in context with Exodus 30, where God reveals something of him for Moses to see, it doesn't mean Moses saw everything about God, but he would have seen some aspect of God. Now, uh, what did Moses see? We don't know exactly. God just said, I will let you see a little bit about me. So I think in God saying, Moses, I will hide I will hide you in the cleft of the rock and you can only see my back. Understand it's not a physical back portion, but it's saying you will see something of me. However, God wishes to wish to express himself to Moses. Just God, God was just telling him, Moses, you cannot see all of me as being in that natural. Okay. So when you see a cloud, when you see a pillar of fire, when you see a burning bush, we're not saying all of God. We're just seeing a little aspect of God, him revealing himself uh, in our natural world. Okay. Hope that helps. Hope now let me take the next one. Beth says, stage of innocence helps explain, stage of innocence helps explain what happens to babies when they die before they come to any understanding that is not spiritually dead, so they go to heaven. But what about the conscience that God has put into each of us, regardless of the knowledge of the law? And what about the verse that says we're all born in sin? Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, so what we're saying is, uh, I think I hope we explained the sequence that, you know, somewhere to this age of what they refer to as age of accountability, you're doing the stage of innocence. If a baby dies, goes to heaven. All right. Now, at that moment when knowledge of commandment comes, it's like the conscience that has been built into that human spirit. It's like, okay, now the system is booted up, right? Now it's been there all the time. God has programmed conscience into that child. And that's why in the stage of innocence, they are so alive to God. There's you know, awareness, they're very open to God. But, and when they come into this, um, this, place of knowing the commandment. It's like, okay, now conscience is kicked in. And it's the conscience that makes them very aware of what's right and wrong, of the existence of God, that there is a God here to be give account to and so on. So it's like the conscience kicks in, so to speak, at that moment of the age of accountability, they're coming to understand things. Okay. From then on, they are accountable, they're answerable. Till then it was a time of innocence. Okay? And that is when we say, as Paul says in verse nine, I died. That's that death that passes on to every human person, if they've not been born again by that time. Okay, say, says, agree on that. Okay, Prabhakar, can we say, Adam and Eve, before they ate the fruit, were in the innocent stage. Is our spirit older than our body because it came from God? So, um, uh, can we say Adam and Eve were in the innocent stage? Um, uh, yeah, I guess we could do that. We could say that they were innocent. Uh, but, um, but uh, not in the sense of them not knowing right and wrong. See, okay, let me put it like this. Adam and Eve were created in a mature state. That means Adam wasn't created as a baby. Or Adam and Eve were not created as babies. They were created as adults, mature. And they immediately had the knowledge of everything around them. So from that sense, uh, uh, you know, they didn't go through the stage of innocence and growing into an adult. They were created as 
adults with creeds with the capacity to know right and wrong with the ability to obey God and so on so in that sense they did not go through the stage of innocence that we're talking about in babies but they were innocent meaning they were sinless but they had the understanding of what's right and wrong or what God told them to do and what God told them not to do so in that sense they were different Okay, that's the answer to the first question, Prabhaka. Is our spirit older than our body? Well, our spirit are created. That means there's an instant in time when the spirit began. So our spirit does not did not exist eternally in the past. Our, our human spirit started in a moment of time, right? Even though it came from God, it was created at the moment of time. Now, we don't know exactly the difference between when the human spirit was created and the form you know the the baby being conceived or formed in the womb we don't know my guess it may may just be the same instant you know i don't know exactly when it happens but uh, so i would just leave it at yeah they're about the same age because i think like we're saying you know the body without the spirit is dead so we cannot have a human being being formed in the womb without the spirit. So I would say, you know, it happens probably at the same instant. Uh, God knows in you know, exactly what happens. Okay. All right, we have crossed over our time. Uh, let's see now, Samuel's. Yes, Samuel. So Samuel's question is, um, Paul is referring to Romans 7, 9. He's talking about the law, which is the commandment, which is the law of Moses. What about the Gentiles? Then there the law equates to conscience. Now you see that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 50, the law that's written in the heart. So the answer is, yeah, uh, that conscience kicks in. The conscience comes alive. Uh, okay, Romans 2 verse 50. Okay, I'm sorry for rushing now. We... Uh, are you all following me? Anybody lost? Any you all together? Okay. So the thought we want to take away, two things to take away before we wrap up. We serve God with our spirit. The human spirit, we're trying to see the development of the human spirit. Okay. So the human spirit also grows and it becomes big. And that's that's the part that we are interested in, which we'll pick up next week. Okay. Could somebody disclose in prayer and then we'll go for a break and come back for our next class, please? Pray. Go ahead. Father, we thank you for your wisdom and we thank you for the teaching that we've received. We pray, Father, to your Holy Spirit will continue to expand this teaching in our hearts, Lord, so that we, our spirit can understand and grow to maturity and to, so that we may walk and worship you in the spirit and in truth. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll take a quick 10-minute break, and we will start the next class on holiness. I'll see you there. God bless. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You.